Welcome to Season 2 of the Pull Hook Golf Podcast. Here's your hosts, Matt Cook and Bobby Brown. Welcome back, everybody, to Pull Hook Golf, the podcast. This is episode number 21, and my God, is it a special one, because guess whose birthday it is today? Me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bobby Brown. <laughs> Who else is on the show? <laughs> <laughs> me, me. I was about to say, I'm like, shoot, I forgot to introduce mm-hmm. myself, but Matt Cook here, mm-hmm. um, and we've got Bobby Brown, and it is Mr. Bobby Brown's yes. birthday. Happy birthday yes. to you, now, what is your favorite thing to do, Bobby, on your birthday? Is there like something special that you do every single year? Think, or is there something you'd like to do every year? Relax. <laughs> Not yell at my kids. Um, well, it's I'm 58, so mm. There's not a lot of us 58 year olds with a nine year old and a five year old. So the big thing for me is um, pancakes in the morning and the boys and Lori singing me happy birthday. That's probably the best thing. And I have about six pancakes and about two cans of whipped cream because I'm the biggest whipped cream fanatic. My boys have inherited that. And um, yeah, I don't know, just enjoying the day. You know, when you get older, you don't think about birthdays. You don't think about birthdays too much. You know, nobody, I, I mean, half, I have four brothers. I, I think maybe one of them text me happy birthday and i'm like oh i didn't text him on this birthday last time so i guess i'll have to get him for next year so i just chill you know i just chill and relax i'm a big you know um high energy guy so i'm always i I always like i don't know it's like i'm at work or something i have a certain set schedule where i go to trader joe's in the morning or i go to whole foods or, or i go to costco and i try and you know have the boys with me thank gosh it's summer because they can't do much on a week off when they're in school and everything like that but you know what the highlight of my day was um my boys just had two weeks of golf camp right and it's golf camp it's basically golf day. it's a daycare at a golf camp is what i found out today and i'll it tell you my story yeah, it's 100 degrees here in Charleston, and we have a little muni golf course. And I always thought I was never going to, like, press golf on them or anything like that. But they are kind of buzzed and amped up after two weeks. And Lori sent me some videos of them, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're starting to get some posture and looking like athletes. And, you know, and so I'm like, we're going to go. I, I thought to myself on the plane, oh, I go, I'm going to take them, and we're going to hit some balls this week. And, you know, Big Daddy's going to come in for some – pointers, not the camp counselors and that kind of stuff. So I took my nine-year-old and five-year-old out at about 2.30 today, this place called Patriots Point. It's beautiful. It's on the water. Um, And um, my nine-year-old has had a really bad blister on his hand. So I couldn't I couldn't really do much with him. Everything was ouch and that kind of stuff. But there's so many little things to when you have bring kids to the golf course, even a driving range for the first time, like trying to keep them really quiet and respect other golfers that are practicing. Ah, good point. Um, no running, you know, just, just things that I take for granted being a caddy or growing up on a golf course and they're just learning. So I got a lot of enjoyment out of that. But if you saw my Instagram, I did my five-year-old, it's it's so funny. I've seen so many golf swings and so many little kids golf swings. You know, what I was doing, I was growing the game today more than you live. So, um, <laughs> so my five-year-old made some swings and he had, you know, I was like, how many thousands of dollars have we spent on this so-called golf camp and i'm looking at my five-year-old and he's gripping it like this like he's got the two thumb grip putter that's how he's holding the golf club and i'm like whoa slow down so had to you know the immediate thing is i threw the club on the ground try and get their feet square maybe kick the left toe open a little bit you know and i got his grip right and that kind of stuff and all of a sudden i started seeing this smooth i don't know just this smooth natural action and i'm like I'm not just popping off because he's my son, but it's probably the first really few golf swings he's ever taken in his life at five. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he gets it. You know what I mean? He gets it. And I'm watching my nine-year-old over there just slashing and burning. It looks like he's doing the polka dance. I mean, I can't get him to hold his feet still. I'm trying to explain some stuff to him. He's getting very impatient. He's wrapped. My five-year-old hits two balls. My nine-year-old hits like 28. And he's, he's like, dad, what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, well, we don't have four hours, but let's just work on that grip right now and posture and stuff like that. But I felt bad for him because he had the blister on his hand. He didn't a, it's it. tough. I mean, when you're young and you got that blister, yeah. it, it really yeah. gets to you. But can I just tell you, Yeah, your five-year-old has a, the Freddie Couples 
tempo. Did you see the whole start? Did you it's see on the rail. flag up there? Yeah. And then the just right. rotates and gets through the head. Why I want when I watch kids and even when I watch these tour players too, I imagine just a little box in the head and that kind of stuff. Because I saw it for two years with Siwoo, you know what I mean? When he was struggling and we tried to get some help from Butch with videos and stuff like that. Siwoo, when he comes down to impact, that head snaps back almost mm-hmm. like this. And that's where Butch was telling me, Bobby, he thinks he gets his power from that. If you can just keep that head there. So that's like a big thing for me to watch, even in pro ams with amateur with the amateurs playing and that kind of stuff. And 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 uh man, he I'm just not saying it because he's my son, but I think he's gonna I think he's gonna enjoy the game and probably hit some quality golf shots. So I'm well, super fired up. I'm super fired up to keep taking him back on the golf course. And if and he swings it like Freddie, he's gonna have a long career. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I took him over to the pot. It, it got so hot. We made it out there about 20, 25 minutes and, and try to keep him hydrated and that kind of stuff. And and they're big. They love punting, right? What kid doesn't like seeing the ball go in the hole? So they, I got him pretty straightened out on that. It's hard to get a five-year-old to align, you know, his putter, his sight line on his putter, but I sharpened up a couple balls. You know, I taught him a little bit. They're really grainy greens. I taught him a little bit about grain and that kind of stuff. And they both buried a couple 12 footers and they're like hold him one i'm like well, <laughs> it's a one pot <laughs> and like what's that mean i go well to me it means great bogey but to other people it means better things <laughs> so it was it was it was super fun and i was super jacked up and and came home and then we had a couple of relatives i have some more relatives coming in town um tomorrow and i'm just enjoying a week off after a great week for my team 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 troy merit last week and let's talk about it what yeah, a, let's get into what, it. what a final round there but let's wow. let's jump back to uh actually start with the 3m out in the twin yeah. cities there in minnesota yeah. well so we talked last we talked last Tuesday. We talked last Tuesday when James Hahn was our guest, and um, um, I don't know if I told you, but I've never seen Troy Mayer at Minnesota swing the golf club so good in my life. Everything I even made the comment to him during the round. I go, I'm not even cleaning the club face because everything is coming out of the middle. The divots are so perfect, and he's just put on a clinic. And honestly, if you pulled up his stats from 3M, you would think, uh, if you left the putting stat out, of course, you would think this guy finished between fourth and seventh they were those kind of stats and you'll never see troy merritt finish in the cellar for putting and he finished in the cellar and he was losing he was losing his mind and he actually had a pretty good pretty good sunday going in tough conditions you know when when, when scott was leading scott pierce he was leading um and i think we were three under for the day with the wind blowing and we got to we got to the hole where Scott made the big mess and plugged yeah. it in the bunker. And we had a nice little seven iron in, and it was kind of a left to right, healthy wind at times, but across. And it was a, it was a perfect club. And when he hit it, it was going right at it. And I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, be good. Just stuff it. Sometimes, sometimes I'll say that to him too. You know what I mean? Just stuff this thing. You know, you can't say it too many times. And I go, just stuff this thing and past impact. I'm like, it looks good. And then halfway up, he's like, Oh, go a little Bob. I got it a little thin mm. and it, it barely covered the hazard line and then it jumped back in and it was like in this, did I tell you it was like in this mud hole or something? And he's like, I think I can get it out if I put it in the back of my stance. You know, it was like two inches below the ground, but it wasn't in the water, but he had to put it on his back hill. And I'm like, man, I feel like if you drive that thing, you're going to drive it right in to the thing. And he's like, I can get it out. So I'm like, okay, I'm out of here. And he got it out about an inch and ended up making double bogey. And this is a guy that's, you know, close to dust in attitude wise it never shows any emotion and he had a big he went to high school like seven minutes from there so he had a, had a posse out there his two little boys his wife courtney and and his range of getting pissed off is like coming out of a bunker and just hitting this 58 degree really hard on his shoes but doesn't say anything might mumble something like that and then he's right back into the next shot you know just how you're supposed to do it and he draw i was cleaning his ball for the bogey putt and it was like 25 feet and he dropped the biggest f-bomb that i like jumped you know what I mean? I'm like, oh my God, did Troy, let's do that. Where are his kids right now? Did they hear that? And um, uh, he made a quick, he made double, he made a quick bogey after that. And I think we finished like 49th, but I don't want people to, to they hear this to laugh, but I mean, that was a 49th with the head scratcher where I'm like, we should have, we should have had something to say about this tournament. That's how good he hit it. So, you know, it's, we got some FedEx points. We didn't lose any spots and it was just, we'll just call it a fluke. Um, and then we rolled into 3M into a practice round and 
the pro-am and he was striping it and and i'm like oh here we go again let's just hope the putter's working right and the, he made some putts during those and then there's a big you mean the rock and mortgage Yes, did I say 3M? I'm sorry, yeah, the Rock and Morgan. Right. Yep. Detroit next week, which by the way is a great golf course built in 1899. Um, it's it's what he likes, it what it's what I like. It's really old, firm, pure Poana, you know, until about 4 p.m. Then it can get a little bumpy when it sure. starts budding and, and flowering. And you know, we got a you know, it's one of those things where you get a good wave and a bad wave. Tony Fino and, and the rest of the morning guys really just had no wind whatsoever. And then when we teed off, it was 20 to 30 mile an hour, southwest, west, southwest, south, southwest, which, you know, to people that haven't played there, everything's a crosswind right now. Things straight down or down off the right. It's a crosswind and I call it a healthy hurdy wind because it's sometimes it's helping, sometimes it's hurting depending on your ball flight. And you really kind of as a caddy, you're hoping that they're chipping clubs in there and not getting it up in the wind. But he got to four under real quick in those conditions was probably the best score. And then um uh and then just didn't didn't rally much after that. It's funny, we all week I'll tell you that his 58 degree goes, a stock one is probably 97, 98 yards. He can juice it to 103. He can, you know, hit it 94, 95. But it's funny, we had all these 94 and 95 yard shots. And on these greens, mm. there you're over a bump with a backstop. Like, so I kept like saying, Oh, I got the same number. You got 94, you got 95, 96, and you got a backstop to 103. And when he got to 400, I'm like, Oh, he could get to six or seven with a couple of these wedges. And he kind of came out of them a little bit. And they would either zip back off the front or, flare right a little bit to 20 or 25 feet. i saw a couple of those yeah, yeah i man. don't know I, I don't i don't know i don't know what that I, I don't know what the deal with that is it's almost as a caddy you're like i want to say i want I, I wanted to say hey listen here's the deal you are four under in tough conditions right now i understand if you want to protect the four under and i'm not saying that he did but i also know that when you're 63 or 64 on the fedex cup list and you are striping it to me as a caddy that's a free roll right fire it fire it everything nothing's nothing can nothing bad can happen and so we got in at four under it was a great score it was a, a top five score for the afternoon and then we came out for our morning wave which i'm like oh we could go yahtzee before the wind kicks up because the green's really start for there's a big difference between 11 a.m and 3 3 20 p.m out there on those greens you have to be very precise on your landing number in the afternoon and we've just shot even on friday and he still hit it really good he hit a couple drives right that's his miss and got out of position but i do know at some point during that d during that round late he's like you know, I'm protecting the cut line. I'm not going to do anything stupid. I'm in advance of the weekend. I know I'm swinging good. Um, so after two days, we're four under, you know, the pack's going away. I'm, we're watching TV, you know, Taylor Pendrith and Tony Finau are just burning every hole. And for those two, for those two bombers, as wide as those fairways are, it, if they get it going, Matt, it's a pitch and putt for yeah, those true. guys. You know, they're just flipping little, they're flipping little wedges in there and, and they're making putts and they were just distancing themselves from everybody. We had a nice sat, we had a nice Saturday and shot four under that probably could have been six or seven. I should say he still wasn't making a ton of putts. He was just hitting it, it close. And then, and then Sunday rolled around and I just had a good feeling about, I just had a good feeling about Sunday. It's funny. I text his coach. Um, Cause the coach is like, isn't the putting any better? And I'm like, well, we're seeing a few go in Steve Dalby's his name. He used yeah. to work with Mike Perez in Arizona. Great, great guy. And I've said it before. He reminds me of Butch Harmon a little bit. He'll just come in with a tiny little tidbit of information every now and then. But when he's on campus, he's just making sure his lines are right. And all the basics, like all the great coaches do for sure. He's not a, he's not a track man or flight scope or a quad guy or anything you know, like that, the modern technology, he's more old school. So I text his coach that night and I go, I just have a feeling something's good. It's going to happen. And he got off to a rocket start and we were, we were five under through nine, maybe birdied the last three, seven, eight or nine stuffed a nice wedge on, on eight from like a buck 24, which is a gap wedge for him on a healthy hurry win, which is, was way back left. And you could, you know, you could either suck it back into the bowl. You could miss in the wrong spot. And I'm like, gosh, we're so due to stop when he hit it probably to, I don't know, man, he hit it to like two feet. And I'm like, Oh, he's rolling. He's Did rolling. He have out. you read that putt? 
<laughs> no, I don't think he. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he didn't. But I know where you're going with that. <laughs> no, he fucking call me. Up. <laughs> you're a pro no, golfer. <laughs> no, but he's a Poana specialist for sure. He's a Poana specialist. I don't know. I don't know why, but it's no coincidence that he, he plays so good at Pebble every year. And from po- and you know when he was struggling at Rocket Mortgage and he was about ready to lose his shit a couple of times, I just had to remind him, I'm like, you know, we got perfect firm Poe, just what you like next week at Rocket Mortgage. Mm. So we turn in five, right? And we probably vaulted up to like 13th or something like that, a phony 13th place because the leaders hadn't gone yet and everybody's- Well, you guys got into the top 10 there for a little bit and then ended up finishing T14. Number 10, he hit it to like, number 10, he almost hooped it. He hit it to- to like that and then 11 he hit a little bit you know this par three he had a great shot in there on a tough pin to like 20 feet looked like that was going in he kind of flared a drive right on 12 got out of position hit an unbelievable shot to 20 feet straight downhill and then just kind of was kind of was bogging down but i should get to 14 14 is a par five that people probably know that know that golf course where you hit it oh first of all the fairways one side of the fairways mowed into the grain the other side is mowed down grain right so it's a big really? yeah it's a big difference it's a big difference i don't even know what the grass is it almost looked like bent grass fairways to me with poana green it, ha- it has to be right can that I happen mean, the, even here i've been counting for 20 years and i don't even oh, know you can people. have yeah you can have different yeah. fairways and different I greens think they were bent fairways so um so we get to 14. Well, I should tell you Thursday, uh, Thursday on 14, it was into the wind. It's an obvious layup, you know, and he's like, what do you think? And I'm giving his numbers to the water and what, you know, let's say a dozen short of the water it's going to be. And we're on that left side of that fairway, that downgrade side. And he's like, I kind of want to push a five iron up there. And I'm like, oh, greedy, you know, greedy. And I'm like, no, it's just a six iron. So he, he's like, yeah, you're right. So he flips the six and lays up in the water. Like those things are embarrassing from the middle of the fairway. I was just so. Bobby, embar- that is all your fault. So I asked him that when we got to the green. Thank God he dropped and stopped his next shot to about a foot because I, and when he, when he rolled that in, we were walking to the next tee and I'm like, is that my fault? He goes, no, that's not your fault. I just hit a big. See, that's pull. the right mindset out of a great player like, is the yeah, fact that he yeah. knows he missed hit it, right? Yeah, it's like, that's not your fault. And you, when it, you commit, first of all, I would, I would pull the club, whether or not right. my caddy was telling me it, it or not, if I wasn't confident right. in the club that, that, that my caddy was giving okay. me. So like for a pro to like, <laughs> play a caddy for anything like yeah, that it's kind of oh you know if i was in seoul south korea i would have probably been fired <laughs> on the spot or something oh you like would have been pushed that. for sure definitely in the back oh, you were so, bad. <laughs> so um uh, so so he stepped into a foot we made five we got out of there and then i want to say on i want to say on friday or saturday we hit it to to the left side again and we're laying up with a six iron. we're laying up with a six iron and he flips another one from that side of the fairway you know and i'm like well this time i know he doesn't have i made sure he didn't have enough club to get to the water so he's like i did it again <laughs> and i'm like no but <laughs> i actually can't eat and you're gonna be fine <laughs> because it's kind of a little disappearing fairway you can't yeah. see over there and then when the ball lands on the downgrade side of the fairway who knows how it's gonna shoot right True. so so we got through that. So I guess what I'm getting to is Sunday when we're six under, he he pipes one down um, left center. It wasn't really hittable for us all week, even though I must tell you a couple of those times we had like 260 front on some left pins. And I'm like, he loves to hit driver off the deck. And he's like, what do you like? And I'm like, and I just looked at him, I'm like, I am okay with you hitting driver off the deck into the grandstand over there on the right. And he goes, God, I want to so bad, but it's a little hook lie. And he makes it fun to caddy for because we we're, we're thinking alike, you know what I mean? Not necessarily the smart strategic play, but putting a little fun mixed in there. So anyway, Sunday, He's six under, he gets a bomb down there. And we have like 210 front, water guards the whole green. It's a it's a tough little right flag. You can't miss right. 221 jar. And he carries a six usually. 93 is like a stock six, you know? So he's like, okay, do you like me just hit? And the wind was blowing a little bit out of the right. It was kind of shifting left and right, but it wasn't a ton of help. And he's like, you like six iron right out of it? And the water cuts out. And I'm like, and I answer, if a caddy answers fast, that's that's it. like telling the player, fuck, no, I don't like that club. So, it, so I'm like, no, absolutely not. I don't like six. You know, I like, he carries a five, two ten. I go, it's just a five iron in the middle of the green. Cause my mind's thinking 
two things. We can't win the golf tournament. want to make another birdie, try and finish strong, you know? And number two, I'm honestly thinking in the mind, in, in my mind, I'm like, both shots he's hit out of this left side of the fairway were left nasty, right? So he's like, yeah, I like it. Maybe I can get on that top shelf and get to 40 feet. And he pushes it right. And it lands like pin high in between some bunkers and it gets into the back bunker on the down slope with only 40 to, to work with. And he's like, oh, I didn't expect it to be here. And I'm like, I kind of did a good job. I thought of slowing him down a little bit. I'm like, cause there's a slope right afterwards about four paces afterwards that shoves it down and you could have 30 feet. And I'm like, just dump it out here to the left and take your 10 footer, right? So he's like, yeah. So he hits a good bunker shot. He dumped it out there to like 10 feet and left it like two turns short in the jaw. And he was fuming. He was so pissed. And I'm like, oh, well, it was not a six iron. It was never a six iron is all I was thinking to myself. <laughs> not that he'd ever be that guy. And then we got to 15, this par three, and it was a perfect club. And he, and he tugged it in the bunker right up against, he's standing outside the bunker trying to get comfortable and, you know, and, 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 and uh, he hits this bunker shot and I'm like, oh my God, this is the whole round changer right here. You know, if he bogeys this hole, you know, it's like get the horsey to the barn at that point and take your top. 25 or whatever but he hits this bunker shot and he just nipped it so perfect and i swear no joke six inches from the hole it's going right in the middle and it just snaps left the crowd goes crazy he got a little juju made another birdie a nice birdie on uh 17 to get to seven under and i believe that's when you thought saw us moving to the top 10 t8 yeah. or t9 right at that point so and he played 18 well all week it was so downwind those guys are flipping wedges into a kooky sloped green you know those old school golf courses that are 100 years old you know they're green complex they're so i grew up in the northeast i mean no there you go unreal it's so underrated and so phenomenal and it's this it's this back pin that uh joaquin you know troy lost in a playoff there last year to yep. walk to cam davis and joaquin yep. neiman and he hit it long on that pin on sunday and troy stuffed one in there to probably five and a half six foot one of those toe tappers and it just caught the right edge but you know, watching the scoreboard, I'm like, oh, maybe we'll hang on for a top 15. And we finished 14th. But the joy that it was just the great way to finish. You know, we're not playing, obviously not playing Wyndham this week. It's 100 degrees out there. It's another great old school course. But guys are beat down this time of year. And if you've ever dealt with Memphis in August, there are a lot other places you would like to be that time of year. Because we always nickname it the Caddy Killer Golf Course, right? Because it's 110 heat index. And any caddy that's slightly overweight or has gout has a trouble getting around there. Kip Henley. Or gout. <laughs> or gout, Kip Henley. I'm talking about Kip, Kip Henley, the self-proclaimed Tennessee Twitter legend who caddies for Will McGirt. So we're taking some time off and we're resting. Oh, but I was going to tell you, we got, I haven't been, been, when I was working with Dustin, I used to get paired with Jason Day all the time and we got paired with him. And can I tell you something? There is nobody nicer. It just hit me again to get paired with than Jason Day, because he is, when he sees a good golf shot from his competitor, even though you're competing, you're, he's still playing the golf course and he recognizes a good shot. And he's so positive when somebody hits a good shot, you know, and it was just, he's a great guy man so he's, we he's were a, trying to do a deal with him back when i was doing golf technology yeah. um and we were working on a simulator deal when which ended up going through after i left the company but yeah. he just is just a super nice guy like and i can't say that about everybody because oh, i've got either. patrick reed i've got hunter mahan on the list of people who are very difficult to deal with yeah. and jason day was the exact opposite actually yeah. tiger was the opposite and that's actually coming from the people that we worked with um yeah. to do th that installation and everything but mm -hmm. um it's just jason day it is tragic as to what's happened with his back and everything. And now it seems like he's finally getting a little bit back to form, which is cool to see, but he's not yeah. quite, he's, you can tell he's not quite trusting it entirely, which it's tough. I mean, you've swung a certain way your entire life and now you're trying to protect your back and swing a different way. Things are mm -hmm. going to creep in. He, he looked great on Sunday. He, he shot six under on Sunday and he got to four under. You right shot off. seven under. I know he got to four or five under right off the bat. It's so funny. Me and his caddy, it, his, it's like one of his best friends, this Aussie kid. And, and, um, uh, you know, we were, I was, I was thinking, remember how James Hahn on his episode was telling me that he was feeding off of Danny Willen. Yeah. 
it was match Almost, play. Yeah. I, that like came to my mind on like six or seven. And I'm like, Troy makes another birdie. This is, this is going to be a tit for tat thing. These guys are going to keep pushing, rooting for each other and keep pushing each other along. And then we got hot. He kind of flattened out, but he lost six under, but can I tell you, it's, even though Troy didn't make a lot of pots, Jason Day is like an unbelievable putter, man. He just, you know, the stories Underrated. about the putting. Yeah, you know, he's got that big putting green facility in his backyard. And he was telling me about it a little bit. He's like, man, I just, you know, I've, I've been hitting golf balls for my whole life. He was like, I love going out in the backyard and just putting for like two hours by myself or with my kids for two or three hours. And I was really paying attention to his routine and, you know, that zone and that focus that, that he was in and that kind of stuff. So it was a great Sunday. I think we moved to uh, 60 on the FedEx cup list. There's some gaps and stuff like that. And hey, we're going to take time. a time out for a second, just yeah. so that the audience knows. And I don't know if you know this or not, but yeah. he has a mechanical green inside as well. So he can change the actual undulations slopes. and slopes yeah. and everything. Wow. So there's pistons. That was the company that or one of the products that we used to have. And awesome. literally he, he installed that with the simulator and everything. So he's got, a complete setup. I didn't so, yeah. know. I didn't know that. I knew Justin Rose had one from his posts on social media. But what is it? What an ingenious idea! Boy, you got to be a world class, wealthy player to have something <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> For, sure. For sure. So it was a great Sunday. We're rolling into the FedEx Cup, the Wyndham's this week. I mean, if we were like points bad or DraftKings or something like that, I would tell people because Jason, Jason, you know, hasn't had a great year, so. He, he's like, I'm playing Wyndham. I got to play Wyndham. And it's funny when he, when he tapped in for par on 18 and I'm like, man, if I was your caddy, I'd tell you to take off next week, but you're playing so damn good. He's like, bro, I'm like 103 on the, I'm Jason day. And he said, I'm Jason day and I'm 103 on the FedEx list. Um, I feel good. And I'm going to play next week. So for any of our guys that gamble out there or anything like that, he could be, could be a good dark horse this week, $2 or yeah. $20 win bet on him. So it was cool. It was one of those cool even though there, you say, oh, you had a great day, and and yeah, you, you know, you rolled to a seven under, and you moved up so many spots and that kind of stuff. There was that, there was that little thirty minutes of drama, you know, on the par five and in the back bunker, and then and then you know, it's just even then when you're six under, you're like, oh shit, it's just so ups and downs, hum out with the emotions and how it affects their confidence maybe for a little bit there's actually something that you mentioned early on about the first couple of rounds and just making sure that you made yeah. the cut yeah. and that's something that really yeah. stands out to me because yeah after missing a couple cuts and then having a decent showing to where you made the cut yeah. but yeah. you didn't finish as well as you would have liked right, right. I, I'm, I'm safe to right. say that then sure. all of a sudden you get into a feeling to where like your putter's been letting you down your swing's really good and all of a sudden things start to click a little bit it's like mm -hmm. you're holding back just a little bit because you don't want that bad to creep back in right you want to kind of make sure yeah. that you get through the cut and it's almost like by sunday he's like screw it he he didn't have or at least it felt like watching him on sunday that he didn't have the this I don't know what the right word for it is, but it was almost like it wasn't pressure. It was more so just mindset as like, I, I can turn this loose now. Yeah. I can start to get after it. And that's yeah. what it felt like watching. I, certainly you're there, you're, you're talking with mm -hmm. them, you're going through the shots and everything. You know better than I do. But I would say that it just appeared that way. And that's where it was like, oh, wow, this is going to come together. And in yeah. a big way, because with the way he's swinging right now, I if know. that putter gets hot, God, can I tell you something? He finished um he finished in second at Memphis one year. I was telling me the story he got beat a shot. And I was fortunate to work for Dustin when he won there in 2013. So all systems go. You know, I was telling you like early in the week, I was like, God, you just fired every flag. It's a free roll. Turns out now that I sit home for a couple of days, he knew what he was doing. You know, he knew that he was striping it and he was going to have one day on the weekend was going to be a pretty good day. So never underestimate the power of a veteran's mind when even a veteran caddy is sitting there going, just fucking fire to everything, bro. <laughs> it's a free roll. You know? Now, this is a topic that we'll get into when we get into live, because yeah. there's a little bit of a difference there. When you go from yeah. not being able to make any money, if you get yeah. cut on Thursday or Friday, well, right. Friday, of course, but yeah. you know what I mean? The first two days, you don't play so hot. And then all yeah. of a sudden, it's like you're keeping it cautious for the weekend. So we'll talk yeah. about that a little bit as we go into sure. it. And just some devil's advocate type of stuff there. Now, 
Tony Finau ends up going back to back. Is there a better guy on tour that like you're just like, man, this guy finally ha- looks like he's broken through? I mean, probably not all the way around. You know, big, obviously a big family man, big giver to the community, big giver to charity. I mean, I don't think anybody has a bad word to say about Tony Finau. And I've probably known him since he was like, you know, 15 or 16. I was probably way back when I was doing some nationwide tour, I guess it was, events and that kind of stuff. And and he was out there and him and his brother Gipper and that kind of stuff. And they just sent it like 370 yards and that kind of stuff. And he is, his path has been a struggle for so long, but he's just, he's just, He's his class. It doesn't get any classier than, it does, than yeah. him. You know, it warms my heart to see somebody like that. He's such a big family man. And he's not just a, such a big family man to himself, but, you know, he's got a wonderful team around him. I'm pretty good, decent friends with Boyd Summerhays, his coach, who was a player out here, you know, off and on for a year or two. Well, it's the legendary Summerhays family. Oh, right? my gosh. I mean, I mean his kids. Stuff. His yeah. boy and girl are both going to be pros. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's just, he's creating does. a stable out there. Yeah. But out there. It, he's right here in Scottsdale. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. He's right there in Scottsdale. But yeah, he's, he's on a roll. You know, I was laughing about, obviously we had James Hahn and we were talking about, remember he was talking about his best caddy was Mark Urbanic and that yeah. kind of stuff. And that's now on, he's now on Tony's bag. And I, you know, I've made this comment before. I'm like, there's so many, there's so many great, awesome caddies that are on average bags right and then they then they get finally get a break with a world-class player and they get to show their stuff what they can do under pressure because i this mark arbanic i've known him for a long time he was a big uh, disciple of andy Plummer and mike bennett the stack and tilt guy so he's really in the stack and tilt he worked for charlie wee and i'll tell you a funny story he worked for charlie wee for a long time who is a, a stack and tilt guru was a solid player out here for a while but he was telling me the story one year when he left charlie wee and i think he went to james Hahn or somebody else and he's telling me the story where charlie wee is two back on sunday in the middle of the fairway at pebble beach and he, it's it's hittable he's got like 256 or something like that and mark's like hey you got like 243 and 13 six over the bunker you got 256 expecting him to go right and charlie pulls on an iron he goes what do i have to do to leave at 95 and mark goes oh i don't think you heard me (laughs) you have 243 256 uh we're we're two back you know go how about we send a three wood up there and try and win a golf tournament and (laughs) he said charlie kiboshed him and he's like hey it's a great week and that kind of stuff and the and, and mark's like you know, I cannot believe he didn't go after the win, you know, and it was just, it was, he was very disappointed in, in that. And, but the story's, the story's just funny, unless you're Charlie Wee and you're listening to this, that you're getting bashed, but that's the difference between some guys and others. Some guys just have big sacks and they try and win golf tournaments, see who's like that. And uh, Charlie decided to lay up and take his T3 three ways and, you know, and move on but i'm super stoked i was super stoked for mark and that's a lot of money for him right that's well over 300 well 100 or 300k he'll probably make he'll you know when this tony you know is making pots i'm about ready matt and i don't know if you agree to graduate him to that level of their unbeatable you know those certain handful of guys I, yeah. I, I i he's one of the guys that i put into the category to where it's like if this guy can putt and do it consistently he will be a force to be reckoned with. His uh, swing is so repeatable. That's the thing. It's not yeah. that it is a phenomenal golf swing because it's short and it's to yeah. the point, which like makes that. it so. Yes, it makes it consistent. You see this out of John Rahm. You see it out of him. Yeah. It's like these short swings from big guys that can get leverage yeah. and they can hit it far. That becomes very repeatable. Hey, Matt, it's, you know, it's a different sound with those guys that are Mm -hmm. short. You know what I mean? It's a different sound than the rest of the guys, you know, the ball coming off the club face. So, you know, all systems, all systems go for his team. Like I said, it's it's super stoked for Mark. James called him the best caddy he ever had. It's funny. I was talking to somebody, they were, they had heard the podcast or something like that. And they're like, oh, I can't believe you remember James said he was a tough bag and how quirky and he's been through 60 caddies or whatever. And they're like, 
did you hear the story why James fired Mark? And I'm like, no, I don't think I really heard the story about that. He goes, yeah, he fired him after they missed a couple of cuts and said, you're writing too much stuff down in your book. You always have your pencil and you're writing too much stuff <laughs> in your book. So it's just funny how some, some players are quirky. And now, and now the, you know, not that the whole world knows who Mark Arbanic is, but the, you know, the caddy world certainly knows who Mark Arbanic is. And he is, uh, you know, he's a good guy and, it, and it's, and it's, some guys, when they went out there, I'm going to be honest and tell you, I get jealous. I'm like, how the fuck did that dude get a guy to the finish line? Or why is that guy on that bag? And, or, you know, this guy should have a different caddy. He'd be so good and that kind of stuff. But not when a guy would like, um, like Mark Urbanic. So it was, it was, it was totally cool. And I like his, he got a little moxie to him, Tony Finau, you know, with the dancing and the, and the dunks, dunk, you know, the SB dunks and the shoes that he wears and the Nike and the Jordan. He's got some swag. He got some, he, he's got some swag for sure. And he's, and he's paid his dues. And let's Actually, be honest. That, that, hang on a second. Oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do this. Wasn't get, planning. I wasn't planning on doing this, but just so that we can talk oh, a little bit about swag. I mean, these uh, these Jordans need, match my shirt. They I got the I shorts to, on. Do I need to impress everybody? Those <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, those are the Air Jordan One Low SE True Blues. That's they right. recently dropped four weeks ago, and if you go to Stock X, it's a much better deal than eBay, and they sell out on the Nike app within an hour. So you know, I'm a self proclaimed shoe expert. You know, you my, are my side hustle those are so for those are so fresh um it's funny you bring up shoes because um troy's manager was out he also has maverick mcneely a great guy named peter webb he has a very he has a very small stable of of players and he's a big j1 low guy and he knows that i'm into shoes and that kind of stuff and i'm like hey man i got so many shoes and i fired him that picture when i was flying home on hurrying home to get on sunday night and he's like how much you want for him and i'm like oh i could just rip his head off right now <laughs> He's Troy's manager, so like, I'm going to be my, you know, all in. Oh, man, you I gave know. him a steal. I know. Well, I can't make any money off of him. Troy's uh, not going to believe me. Troy's like, Bob, I know you too well. You're going to, you pack like $5 or $10. And then I showed him a couple other pairs, so, you know. Uh, so after taxes and shipping and everything, like, well, that's pretty much know, straight up. You know, when you go to eBay, they just bang you on shipping, and it's worse for the seller. I've sold so many shoes on ebay there's it's just worse for it's worse for the seller you know you get all these fees and stuff like that but you got great taste man that match that shirt they match that for sure and anytime you get that elephant print on the back oh, like that, it's so that that's what sold me because i'm yeah. like all right we've got the travis scott's that have that blue yeah. you've got yeah. some other ones that had the blue as well and then all of a right. sudden i saw yeah. the print and i'm like the, I yeah. have to have these and I'm on the Nike app to where right. I'm looking for upcoming drops all the time. I'm obsessed with <laughs> the, uh, the air Jordan, the, uh, the one yeah. low and, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, every, I, everybody thinks I'm a sneaker head. I'm not because I right. wear them I and am. I beat them up. I yeah. beat them up. I, I don't really store them. I think I sent you a picture of like the yeah, couple that are in like my up. storage. Yeah. That's not, I was, imp I was impressed. Hey, I'll tell you another little funny story. Kevin Strillman's a little bit of a sneaker head too, but everything has to be Duke blue devil devil covers. And Troy lets me go. Like Troy's like go for caddy on this. He makes fun of me because I'll four caddy on a couple par fives or something like that. So we were walking through this tunnel on, I think it was on Sunday and I, I went four caddy like on 17. I'm like, or, or one of the holes, he didn't need me there. And I, and uh, we were talking about shoes um, during the round. Actually, this was Saturday. And uh, Kev's like, uh, Bob's going to four caddy. <laughs> and Troy goes, something must be dropping on sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the sneakers app is great yeah. as well. And that's where you get the yeah. exclusive stuff. That's where you get For the sure. Travis Scott's. I actually yeah. got the uh, the Travis Scott's, the new ones, the reverse mochas. You did. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky wow. enough to get those. How did and you get so lucky? Because I put Scott Stallings is into him. John Yarborough, his caddy's into him. We're all into him. Doug Gim, his whole camp. He's a Nike camp. Doug gets him, but his his, his like assistant. Remember Michael was saying? It was Luke? luck, Bobby. It was yeah, luck it is, is what it was. I, won, I always win like the three threes you know i win the threes like i won the desert elephants that just came out last week and i'm like wow oh, those are money i actually yeah, wanted those i actually didn't i didn't go after those 
I ice them for, you know, I ice them for a while and just kind of watch. It's like, I'm an, it's like, I'm an addict. It's like, I, like I, I stopped drinking a year ago and most caddies boredom drink in the hotel room and that kind of stuff. But man, I do like six hours of scoring time on stock X and I do a, a lot of research and it's like, a, it's like a game for me. Some, some, do you ever go on make, goat? Uh, oh yeah, I've been on Go, but I like StockX better. Oh uh, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, both They're, tend I to like verify, thing. but yeah. Well, so StockX got that bum rap, you know, that Nike sent them some shoes and they were fakies and they authenticated them. But I can tell you that I've I've bought many shoes from StockX and they and sold them via eBay and they had, and they got reauthenticated again. Oh, so it's but uh, what I like about StockX is you can see how everything's the fluctuation of the market, right? They True. tell you every pair and what it's sold when they're reporting that kind of stuff so if you catch them at the right time and now i'm getting a little bit smarter where i will go to like the sneaker not the sneakers app but the nike the regular nike app once every two weeks will tell you what's going to drop so mm -hmm. for some reason some i don't know how they do it matt but some shoe sneaker heads or shoe companies get a lot of those shoes before they drop so, so there there I is buy definitely a vip list there, there's, yeah. a, there's a VIP. If you buy them all the time and Nike recognizes yeah. that, you get added to a VIP list, which I was added to, which was right. kind of cool. And then you get notifications to where like other people don't like when the reverse mochas drop. Yeah. People, like you didn't get an alert for that. They just yeah. appeared on the sneakers yeah. app. Right? right. And so I ended up getting an email around it saying, hey, we're dropping this tomorrow. Right. Just as a heads up. It was like a 24 hour deal. And sure right. enough, like I was able to get in and get that before it freaking went yacht, like just it's, ha it, ham out there. Not Yahtzee, ham. It went ham. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. It, it, are you, don't wear those. Don't wear those. Oh, are you kidding me? I, no, I, I'm I'm 100% wearing those because here's the thing. I'm not a sneakerhead. Like people who are sneakerheads, I look at as collectors, right? Collectors yeah. put them in cases and they save them up to make money and then they'll sell them at some point, mm -hmm. like down the road. That mm -hmm. is not what, like I do it for style. I like, I like to yeah. have shoes that kind of match the stuff that I'm wearing. And yeah. it's just, I, I mentioned this in one of the early episodes of this podcast and talking with Mikey. And for a while there, I couldn't get a drop to save my life. It's like, funny how it goes in streaks. Same with does. me too. And then I'll win three or four and then I'll win three or four in a row. And I am on that. I am on this thing at like 9.59, 55 seconds, you know, because they all <laughs> yeah. drop at 9 or 10 a.m. And I hit the button and I'm like, this where is, to go <laughs> this is not fair this no. is not fair but you know Did what you know? i didn't realize was such a popular thing and my fiance had to explain this to me so remember those jordan um i'm gonna space on the name because once again folks i am not a sneakerhead, so i do not know all the naming and everything but the uh it's on our instagram page at pole hook golf uh on instagram and it is the jordans the uh it's not the tuxedo ones. It's the ones that they came out with. 11. Um, they're the 11s, but they are whatever the edition of them are. But it's the blue, right? With kind of uh -huh. like the, it's almost Gums looks hole. like graffiti uh, on them yeah. for okay. the uh, actually where the taxi used to be in terms of the black yeah. area. Um, only, I feel like only sneakerheads are going to understand what the hell I'm talking about, but <laughs> including yourself. You're, you're kind of like caught in with me but the sale version of those the color sale the khaki color yeah i'm like when i first saw them i'm like oh gosh you know that's a that's kind of a tough look those are so much higher valued than the ones i got that are like this color blue right like, there's like this accent right. of blue and i'm like oh these are going to be super popular which it's funny because all of a sudden i mentioned this to my fiance and she's like Oh yeah, you don't know that uh, the Kardashians wore that color, and all of a sudden, like everybody's crazy about that color sale from Nike because they wore some like apparently either Air Force Ones or something like that in that color. Are you talking about mochas, like a mocha? No, it, it's called sale. Like it's this khaki color. Okay. Yeah, when you get a chance, Google that I because Google that. it, it is. Serious. They came out with the Jordan Elevens shortly after I bought mine. And they mm -hmm. were like a couple weeks later and mm -hmm. these things sold out in a heartbeat. Like I couldn't get the drop on them. And then I'm like, Oh, no big deal. Whatever. Like I probably wouldn't have worn them that much anyways. And sure enough, she tells me, she's like, Oh yeah, you realize that those are going for like two times the price and yours are like, 
fifty dollars less than retail. <laughs> like, yeah, I know it's cra- it's crazy it's crazy how that is. Like those, that's why I'm telling you, you're not going to win those Travis Scotts. I mean, you probably bought them for one forty, winning them to two hundred, and they're selling they're all their thirteen hundred dollars or above oh, right no. now. I'm it's not crazy. selling them though. Hey, no, nah, I know. Hey, I'm um, uh, want to talk about golf? <laughs> 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 At Bobby Brown Golf, any of you sneakerheads? <laughs> Yeah, let's get back into it because one of the guys, so obviously we talked about Tony Fina winning back to back and that guy's, I mean, probably the hottest golfer right now in terms of just streakiness going into, um, I mean, I don't, he's not playing Memphis, is he? Who? Tony. Uh, you mean Wyndham? Wyndham this or week? Wyndham, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The big boys are t- the the big boys are taking off Wyndham. You know what? You know what Wyndham's famous for. This is where like you lose your card or your status, right? This mm, is the okay. last week for the the one twenty five, and we'll talk Wait, about. Why it a was I bit. thinking Memphis? No, because know. we talked about Memphis because that's yeah. the next week, and that's the big Kahuna, the start of the big Kahuna. That's where right. Make twenty or twenty five million dollars, but you were getting at something. I think you were gonna ask me about a certain player or something. I like was. That. So how about Cameron Young? This kid, <sighs> what's gonna happen when this kid actually like really oh breaks through? Gosh. I'm gonna give you um he's gonna be a top ten player in the world. He's gonna be on Ryder Cups. He is probably going to be on this upcoming President's Cup in the fall because when we warmed up on Sunday, Trevor Immelman, the the um, international coach, was watching him. It was Trevor. Im- it, it was it was Cameron Young. It was Troy Merritt, and then there's the new Korean, the new Kim. Tom, we call him Tom Kim, the one from Australia, the night the twenty year old that's going Yahtzee that set the course record on Sunday. J H. Yeah, he's 20. It's, um, uh, I can't pronounce his first, it's Tom. He speaks perfect English. You know, we got paired with him at 3M and I've been hearing about him. I've been hearing about him from a gentleman that I'm connected to in San Diego, Rambert Sim, who Wait, is- Wait, hang on a second. This is you, you or Ju Young? Yeah, Ju Young Kim. Ju yeah. Young Kim. Tom. This yeah, kid, Tom. he was, so he caught my eye actually. Gosh, we're going to get sidetracked because this That's kid caught my eye at the Genesis over in Scotland before the Open yeah. Championship. Oh, he had a chance to win And that. he went yeah. Yahtzee on Sunday. He's yeah. the first player that I have yeah. seen recently who has gotten into the zone. On yeah. like, and, and when I say zone, that kid couldn't miss. I mean, he was he, he was sticking all of his iron shots. He was making all of his putts. And then he yeah. did the same thing this past weekend. And yes. was, once again, he just he fell just short because he wasn't in position. He shot the course record on Sunday. He he we played with him on well, on Saturday in in Minnesota. And you know my famous Shiba word, Shima means means fuck. And he knows. He knows all about me, and I know all about him with the Koreans I work for. That kid's for. fun yeah. to watch. Up. He's, he's, he might be on that president's cup. Cameron Young. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back yeah, let's go you back. Know, my son, Daniel Gregory, is the man on the Corn Ferry Tour. And every year, I, like, ask him for a name or something like that. Give me, give me a name that nobody knows about, Dan. You know your shit. And I'm going to say it was two and a half years ago. He goes, Dad, Cameron Young is the real deal. And my, my son, somebody says he like could win 20 times on tour. I'm like, yeah, sure. He's going to win 20 times on tour. So he played at Wake, right? Wake Forest. And he played with Will Zalatoris a little bit. So the next day after Daniel said that, I, I, walk, I, I ran into Will Zalatoris somewhere. And I go, tell me a little something about Cameron Young. And he goes, oh, he's no scaredy cat. Does things his own way. He's a little different. He does things his own way. And he came out with a friend. Um, Caddy and Foreman got off to a good start this year. Um, when I worked for Ogletree, when Troy got the COVID at Sun at Sony, we he missed the cut, but we played with him Thursday and Friday. But I'll tell you, number eleven at Sony. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it's about a 385 yard hole where they hit. It's got water down the left, and it comes out like two. The water cuts out twice. It cuts out once at where to cover two sixty two forty five, and then there's a little like hard in the middle, and then it cuts out again at about two ninety five that you have to cover. And guys usually hit a hybrid off that tee, or maybe some guys will get greedy and hit a three wood. And I watch this guy tell his caddy, he goes, and it was straight down wind, which we don't get there, and he goes. I might be able to knock this on. And I'm like, huh, okay, you know, I've been here 15 times. I'd like to see this. And sure as shit, he got off a nut and he was like 15 yards short of the green. And I'm like, I had never seen a drive like that before. And, and I was like, man, this guy is so good. And he has since made a caddy change three weeks ago to one of my good friends, Chad Reynolds, who spent years with VJ. He spent years and wins with 
um, Nick Watney. He was working for Cameron Champ and he got the call to go to Cameron Young. So I was talking to him on the phone and he goes, hey, do you got a place to stay for the Scottish? I need a place. And I, and I like went through the field and I'm like, well, Champ's not even in the field. Are they letting him like, you know, get into the field late? He goes, he calls me Boudrizi. That's his nickname, Boudrizi. He goes, Boudrizi, I'm going to Cameron Young. And I just looked at him and I go, you just hit a mini powerball. He goes, come on. He's always like that. Come on. I go, you have no idea how good this kid is. And uh, and he's showing it. I think he'll get, I think he's going to get picked for that President's Cup team. I mean, open you. championship, finishing second in the way he finished. And then. Yeah, yeah make an eagle on 18. Like I actually, to be completely frank with you, I thought before the week heading into the Rocket Mortgage, I thought he was the leading horse. And I actually thought coming into Sunday that he was going to close out that deal over Tony, but he yeah. just couldn't get anything going. Like, yeah. and, and that was where I actually saw for the first time with him because I haven't watched him that much, but right. seeing him play probably a handful of times, maybe more. Um, I just was like, his short game is a little bit suspect, which can be cleaned up like chipping around yeah. the greens. Like he, yeah. like he had a pretty standard chip on Sunday to where he left himself like 12 feet. And that's something to where like you're expecting yeah. three feet or less normally yeah. um, from these guys. And it wasn't a tough chip. And then out of the bunker and I started looking at his stats and stuff. I pulled a Bobby Brown. I actually yeah. went and started looking at stats and sure enough, like that's where he struggles. But my goodness, his T his T to green. Right. Is on rail. So, you know, what's funny. I asked you, I saw Chad last week. We we're sitting down at nine breakfast and I'm like, man, this kid's a real deal. Huh? And he goes, oh, Boudreezy, you have no idea. He goes, unbelievable putter. And I'm like, wow, really? And and he's like, yeah, dude, he's like he an unbelievable putt. putter. So I don't know much about his stats. So is, are his putting he, stats? His putting stats to are green? fine. His tee yeah. to green is unreal. And then it, bunker play and around the green, his up and down ratio isn't the greatest. So that's yeah. where he falls back a little bit. But man, yeah. is he just like his swing is looking good. And think about it during the off season, if he can tighten yeah. up his short game a little bit, just chipping and bunker play. Hey, I just thought of something sleepy hollow. Dad's the man of sleepy hollow is that your neck of the woods, right? So yep. you, yeah, that, yeah. So he was, he was probably bred to be a champion. You know, these guys, these young guys, when they get a good team behind them and it sounds like he has a good team behind them, they have these little team meetings with the caddy and the agent and the coach and probably his oh, yeah. dad's his coach. I don't know. And they, they'll they hash through those stats that Zach Johnson's famous for it. He kind of started it and like, where do we need to get better? You know, and then so he'll probably spend his off season grinding on that. And, you know, who knows who the next number one player in the world's going to be. But, you know, man, he starts winning some golf tournaments and it starts opening up and, and this the sky he's, he's one of those that the floodgates could open like we saw yeah. it with scotty scheffler everybody was saying as soon as he yeah. breaks through he's going to break through in a big way tony's right. kind of been the same way yeah except mm -hmm. tony's always kind of had the putting issues right it so it's like little, uh, it looks a little, a little janky it looks a little it looks a little janky sometimes for sure you know but, but he's such he, a good athlete and player that it's like man at some point he's gonna figure it out hey taylor pendrith had played had would play pretty good the big canadian he's a yeah. big came back from an big, injury yeah you know he broke a rib he actually yeah. <laughs> broke a rib and then came and then came back but they did this little um um on the coverage they had the, their, the that kent state golf coach i can't remember his name who's now retired can't think of as, it created a dynasty there he gets all the canadians i think mackenzie hughes Corey connors taylor pendrith but in 2014 there's a player out here named sam Ryder, and they had corn fairy Tour, Ryder, yeah, yeah web.com q school at honda where we play the honda and then they played the honda course and then didn't you played sam the make a hole in one on 16 this year at uh yes. Waste management? yeah he did. yes that he was did. that was sick. I, highlight of his career but i caddy for sam Ryder in this thing and taylor pender this was this is man this is eight years ago and we we're on the other course not the honda course that everybody knows and number one out there is this uh, straight dog leg right to left where you hit it like three wood max out towards the water right and i watched this kid you know and i'd never heard of him before and or you can 
apparently bombing over the houses and almost drive the green, but I watched him two days in a row bombing over the houses, you know, and I shared that story with him last week. And I'm like, man, I was in that group behind you. And, and he's like, man, you got a good memory. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm a caddy. And, <laughs> you know, and so he kind of came on my radar there, but he, he's, he's another name for the future. I'm not sure if he is, you know, a top 20 player or not, but I was so, I get, I love hearing these college coaches when he's like, they're like, how did you find him? And he's like, man, we went to a junior tournament and we watched him the way he's built and the way he compressed the golf ball. And we didn't care if he could chip or pot. We, you know, we didn't care. We just knew what we saw as an athlete, you know, and, and that was pretty cool to hear a coach say something like that, that, you know, it's just sign of the times where these coaches are just getting athlete. We'll make them a good player, right? These college coaches will make them a good player. So he's a name to watch too. So much, so much young talent coming up and get off track. You know, we have a huge amateur tournament this weekend, just outside Chicago, the Western, which is like just one notch below the USAM and that's Mm -hmm. coming up too. And there's, you know, if you get bored or anybody out there wants to follow some college golf, watch this leaderboard of the Western amateur. There's, I'm sure there's a major winner there in there or two. So, you know, nice. golf is, golf is good. There's a lot there, of tours Bobby. to play on right now. <laughs> there, there, there is. And that leads us into our next yeah. topic. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the elephant in the room, live yeah. golf Bedminster. <laughs> let's right. so let's you, jump right into it. So I'm going to open up by, by saying with, Having James Hahn on last week opened my eyes to, I'm not bitter anymore. You know, I'm not bitter anymore. Things are making more sense to me. Um, James Hahn, a little background on him. He is obviously very intelligent, as you found out. Before he says something about something. I was very impressed. Wow, was I ever. He, you know, he does a lot of research and everything like that. And what we didn't mention on that podcast was that James Hahn spent probably eight years on the PAC board, the Players Advisory Committee. So he's in on all those meetings. And he used to tell me, I'm like, how'd that PAC board meeting go? And he goes, well, if you're Jordan Spieth, and this is no knock on Jordan because he's a great guy. He goes, if you're on Jordan Spieth and you're on the PAC board, they listen to you. If you're James Hahn and you have an idea, they, they're they like, I'll think about it. But I wouldn't say I flipped because you're like, oh, I think he flipped you and everything like that. But I'm well, we, we, we talked about that educated. afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I'm certainly I'm certainly more educated that this tour is not going away. I had a buddy that I went to high school with named Todd Brown, who's a pretty successful businessman in New York City. Um, he went down and watched. And he's like, hey, I'm going to live. And I'm like, man, you got to give me the scouting report. And honestly, I'm not talking shit or anything. He's like, it's nothing, man. It's a, it's a lot of music going on. You know, you, you walk away from the clubhouse. It's dead as a doornail. The whole shotgun factor, you know, yes, there's crowds around DJ and the leaders and that kind of stuff. But the but the rest of the deal is no big deal. And it's just not that it's just not that exciting from his point of view. And here's a guy who I've, I've given tickets to, to multiple majors and, and he's probably been to 30 golf tournaments on the PGA tour in his life. So he wasn't to, he, from his point of view, from his fan perspective, he wasn't um, totally. Which day impressed did he go? I don't know. I think he went away. Oh, he went the first two days. So here's, you the, know, they only it, play three it, rounds on that tour. Yes. <laughs> There's only three folks, but yeah. I actually saw something from uh, Colin Burns from Wingfoot. He's the GM at Wingfoot mm-hmm. and he went down because mm-hmm. he wanted to see what all this was about. Right. And he mm-hmm. actually had some pretty positive things to say about it. Oh, that he, it. He, he was very much so around the fact that like, and he was staying very politically correct and so forth, because obviously ties to, usga pga Uh tour so on and so forth that uh and he just said he's like listen people were having a blast out there they were having fun and and that was the big takeaway that i saw from him and it also like came through on the broadcast to where like yeah i i totally get it the the guys that are let's put it this way the guys that are not very big names that mm-hmm. just kind of fill out the rest of the 48. You're not going to yeah. see big crowds around that. And you're going yeah. to, you're, but you also don't see that really with the PGA tour either, even at the waste management, no, you, you know don't. that no, like no, there's no, not people no. out in the big yeah. portion of the yeah. golf course. They're all hanging yeah. around the hot spot. which sure. if you're going to that event and you're a new golf fan, you're going to be yeah. around the music. You're well, going to be in you're the right. entertainment area, right? You're not going to be out yeah. in the middle of the golf course looking at golf. You're going yeah. to be having a blast. And that was one of the things that I took away to where I'm like, one, the broadcast got better. Bringing in Faraday, 
was a great move. And he's, and a great story, he's a great storyteller. Which is tough. Well, here's the thing. Because it's shot after shot after shot, you don't have the time to build in these storylines like you do on a PGA Tour broadcast. Because you've got mm-hmm. a lot of time. Especially watching these guys come down on Sunday and you're literally just following that leader group other than like great shots that happen from other groups or like somebody making a move. And you've got to build out these big storylines and you've got to build up the whole entire anticipation, why this is important. You're giving stories about the people that are in the lead. Like it was all about Tony Finau, right? You knew that he was kind of running away with it, and it was like, all right, nobody's going to catch him. I mean, you got to the 10th hole, and you're like, all right, the, this tournament's done. Tony's going to win. Yeah, like you just well. knew that that was going to yeah. happen. And so I to credit the broadcast, because they do a great job, and they build out those storylines. But that's something on Live that when you're going shot after shot after shot, there's very small amount of time yeah, for a to broadcast react. to react and then to build out those storylines, right? So yeah. that's one of the things that I felt like was missing is that they didn't have storylines. They didn't – in the first couple broadcasts, th- there wasn't that. And now all of a sudden you bring in Faraday, who he will hit you with a one-liner – yeah, and again, I, I go back to the fact that this is that audience of top golf people. This is the audience from the pandemic that were like, I just want to get outside. And then all of a sudden they took a liking to golf, but don't really like watching golf. Like right. this fits an audience and it's fast and it's kind of action filled. And I just go back to my fiance, who's not a golfer. She loves going to top golf and she literally came into the to, to the bedroom and I've got on one screen live golf and I've got on the other screen the uh, broadcast for the tour and I'm watching both and she goes oh this isn't live and then I'm like no it's on the other screen oh, yeah. and so it was funny because she watched for like a couple minutes right and I think that's the sentiment and us purists from a golf standpoint we have a tough time mm-hmm. accepting any type of change I said this earlier um, to a group that I was training around podcasting and so forth that it's like, listen, people don't like change. They don't Mm -hmm. like it. Like think about change. Like even if it's Uh, great change, sometimes it takes people a while to get used to change. And that's something that I'm seeing with Live Golf in particular, because if you're watching it and I, I brought this up on a quick little thing on Instagram that I did and put that out there around just doing a quickly like re recap. Around live golf, because I don't think enough people are kind of I mean, yes, you're starting to see some of the major media sources, but they're all jaded, right? They're they're all kind of positioning everything in a particular way. I want to take a very neutral approach to it. And that's where I'm like, wow, first of all, you've got guys out there and it hit me around showmanship that I'm like, I haven't seen this type of showmanship to Mm -hmm. where it's not arrogance and tiger when he came out in 96 i mean he was criticized bobby do you remember when he came out was doing all the fist pumps was running off to the side and fist pumping and like screaming Uh he was criticized left and right for that but that's what got people glued into the tv and what actually grew the tour Well, you're seeing somebody, and I bring this up as the example. This isn't the perfect example by any means. But you got Henrik Stenson, who is one of the most serious guys. Like, Mm -hmm. he's not a, you know, happy-go-lucky kind of guy. He's very serious about the way that he goes about his business. It's very, like, methodical. And he's out there kissing his famous two wood after he stripes a shot. And he's, he's hamming it up with the crowd. And clearly, he's somebody that as a perfectionist probably is what my assumption is then that's why he's so serious that all of a sudden he gets a moment to relax and he plays his best type of golf. I mean, wins it by two shots and you would see, you you saw it with Matthew Wolf on, on the final day to where Matthew Wolf's out there going Yahtzee. And like, it was the Matthew Wolf that we saw when he first came out on tour, but then clearly things happen on tour that put Matthew Wolf in that mindset that well, he was struggling mentally. Can I make a comment on that? When you 100%, get, please do. Well, well, when you know you've already paid 40 or $50 million, you're going to be a little more loosey-goosey because you know Henrik 
I've been paired with Henrik a lot. And I was paired with early Henrik, who was a firecracker, right? Who would, would get very pissed off. And Callaway tells, you know, see, Wu had a club breaking problem. And every Monday I had to make the walk of the shame into the, into the Callaway trailer. And they'd be like, what do you got? What do you do now? You know, it's the five wood or it's the three wood. I'm sorry. You know, we're trying to work on it. He's trying to get better. He sends his sorries and that kind of stuff. And then like, remember one of them was telling me one day, he goes, Stenson comes in like twice a year. It needs a whole new set. He goes back to his hotel room and <laughs> effing snaps everything. I know? hate to laugh, but it, it is yeah. kind of comical. He, and he's, he's, um, you know, Mr. Serious and everything like that, but he's got a really great sense of humor. I've been paired with him before where he's, you know, most of those Swedes have sneaky, good senses of humor. Him and him, Jonas Blix, Alex Norn's super serious. He's not really like a sense of humor guy and that kind of stuff, but he's really, he's really kind of funny. But remember how I was telling you, well, I'm going to back up my buddy Todd that went to the tournament told me it's a mini, it's a mini Scottsdale. He got yeah. the vibe. It's mini Scottsdale. That's what it felt with like. The golf, with the golf tournament going on because you can see those guys are under any stress because they have so much money. But I will say this. Remember how I was like totally banging? Like you never see Dad Pumpkin Ridge, Dustin Johnson talking to anybody. So I turned it on again, you know, for the last nine holes because now I got to watch, you know, and now I'm understanding that even though I'm always going to say, well, these guys aren't relevant out here anymore and they haven't been doing well and that kind of stuff. Well, honestly, those are the guys that the crowds come to see, right? Those are, those are the guys that, that kind of sell tickets a little bit. Yeah. Everybody loves to see Dustin. And I saw, I saw Stenson and I saw Dustin, you know, I saw them doing their things that I saw when they were on the PGA tour, trying to win majors or golf tournaments and that kind of stuff. So they're being very serious and, you know, the, the news is out now that in 2024, certain four players are going to be relegated and they're, they're going to have like a, a Q school runoff and that kind of stuff. So have you been invited to the Pat Perez relegation party yet? <laughs> Has that invite caught now? Because this no. guy made $1.8 million and he can't, he can't crack an egg and he's, well, you know, that's what makes this whole big man thing on, interesting he, because he big man on campus, just the way he likes to be. Fuck, I shot 80 and I made 900 grand. Honey, go shopping tomorrow. <laughs> she, she'll come out with an Instagram post of all of her bags at the mall. She did that the last time after the last event. But Jeez. with that said, the aces, I mean, you've got three guys. that They're unbeatable. They are, right? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, are we watching? Because their logo kind of looks like the Alabama Crimson Tide. Oh, and I'm 100%. like... Are they Alabama right now? Are they building a dynasty? But wow. the the weak link is if Perez. It, it is, <laughs> and I mean, no, no, I, I'm not taking a shot at Pat because Pat he his scores counted in the first event that they played, which was ended up being the second event for Live. Yeah, Alton but his Portland. score didn't count on his score didn't count. He, on no, Sunday. none of his scores counted oh, in this yeah, event. Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Th this yeah. event, he struggled, did not have a good time, but it did bring up an interesting like perspective where it's like the mindset. He's coming in on Sunday because the first two days, only two players of a four-man team, those scores count. And then right. on the final day, three scores count. Right. So you can't have to where like, and he started yeah. off well to begin the round and then he kind of faded away and yeah. maybe it was because he saw that all three guys were playing well and he's like, Oh, I can kind of pack it in. Who knows what that mindset uh, was like, but this team, I mean, could you imagine? And yes, <laughs> the relegation part. If you know the relegation part, if he keeps, if he keeps playing like this, I know, you know, I, I know for a fact that him and DJ had a big falling falling out years ago. Like they didn't talk, like they hated each other. It was a big drama scene at Pebble Beach in 2013. It got ugly, you know, and I know they didn't talk. And I know that he was like an older brother to the Gretzky. So, you know, the deal DJ and the Gretzky's got together and probably and obviously put this deal together for him. But I know one thing about about Dustin. He's you know, if he keeps shooting and. I don't know. I, I know two things about Dustin. You know, Paulina runs the family. That's for sure. You know, the Gretzky's are a big influence on him. But, um, man, I don't know. Somebody's got to draft. Somebody's going to get draft somebody on these. You know, if this Aussie team comes, if this Aussie team comes out with Cam Smith and, Le and Leishman, and I'm going to tell you, obviously, I told Did you. Did you just I drop a little... Uh... Something well, it, there, Bobby? that's the rumor that there's an Aussie team that's going to, that's going to, I got a couple good rumors I'm going to drop to it's you. It's happening. 
I picked Jason Day. I picked Jason Day's. I was really careful about it, but I asked Jason Day. They, they, him and Troy kind of were walking five or ten yards in front of us, and they're talking. Well, hey, you know, that's the big topic, right? What you know? What do you think about this? What do you think about this live thing? Streelman on Saturday and Troy were talking about it, their opinions and stuff like that. And 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 I just asked Jason. I go, well, they had to come after you, didn't they? And he goes, well, not personally. And I'm like, I started, me and Troy started laughing. And well, I go, what a, ve- what a great veteran answer, you know, not you personally. And he goes, yeah, they came after my agent, but the number, you know, the number wasn't right for the, and he just said it, he goes, the number wasn't right for me to go. And then listen to what he said after that. He goes, Bryson's been trying to recruit me for a long time. And he's calling me all the time. So these team captains the Monahan and company have to deal with this is that these team captains are getting on the horn to other players and they are selling hard to recruit other guys because that team on paper, you know, even with Perez, it could be a three, it's a three legged team right now. And he's been taking shit in social media for it. Well-deserved, but he's picking up these big checks, but they got to deal with these other players recruiting other players. So I don't know what Jason's deal is going to be. I don't feel like he's at that point yet to tell you the truth, but he did, he did, he looked me in the eye and he says like, yeah, Bryson's been, Bryson's been recruiting me and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I got, I got a little bad vibe and a little bad vibe just because Kevin Streelman got brought up a great point. And, and, and I believe he's been on the pack board before. And he said, you know, if it's anybody, but Greg Norman, if you were to put a guy like Nick Price in Greg Norman's shoes, that was doing the, that, that was the leader of this whole deal there would have been communication between mm. the PGA tour and live. If it was a different personality other than Greg, right? Because Greg's had this hard on for the PGA tour for so long. And I've also come to find out that Jay, as much as I respect him and that kind of stuff, he, nobody was closer with Fincham than Jay was. He was like groomed to be the commissioner. Yeah. I'm under that impression. And so I'm sure he gets advice from Fincham, from Fincham still, but you know, I think just like you said way back when, Matt, the deal is, is that maybe, you know, they can't take my caddy credential around this because we're going to let 1,600 people view this and um, hopefully 17. And, um, you know, he just we're didn't, didn't go wrong, <laughs> didn't, didn't go about this the right way. If it's somebody different like Nick Price, you know, it probably could have gone down a little bit different. But I was going to tell you, you know what, it's just like you got Norman that's going to the PGA Tour, you got. Listen, whoever's president of the United States, half the people are going to hate you, half the people are going to like you. And you got you got fatty Trump out there doing his thing. And it's just like, oh, let's see how bad we can we can butcher the PGA tour. I'm going to tell you my Trump, you know, so, you know, I caddy for this is a funny little Trump, the little funny little Trump. You got to share for the because during the COVID my whole life, every single day was sitting on that couch waiting for Trumpy to come on at 4 p.m. You know, I couldn't (laughs) wait to see what this character was going to say about the respirators or the mask or when I'm going to get that goddamn six hundred dollar check in the there mail. There was a lot of news coverage at that shit. time. I mean, that was like the high. We had nothing else to do, right? We had, I couldn't go buy groceries or anything like that. And you know, you start thinking some weird shit. So I'm like, oh man, this Trumpy dude is a character. So, anyways, when I caddy was caddy for Sampras up in that celebrity thing, we draw the first two days. We get Trump and we get John Elway, right? And this is and Trump thinks he's a good golfer. He's fucking horrible. He is not a good golfer. No matter what, anybody, oh, he can play golf. He can get around. Yeah, sure. From two tees up, he's probably going to crack. He's going to crack 90 or something. But he had this big, huge bodyguard with him all the, the whole time. Right. And Sampras is a very doesn't talk a lot. And he doesn't like to be talked to. And I had a, a cool relationship with him. So we're standing on one. We were standing. We were walking down one fairway and he comes up. He comes running up to me. He's like, Pete Sampras, the greatest tennis player of all time. What's your secret? How'd you do it? Because at that time, Pete was the greatest tennis player, you know. And Pete's like looking at him like, you know, oh, you know, I started playing when I was young and that kind of stuff. And he would like walk away and Pete would look at me and he goes, God, I was like, I would shut the fuck up. Right. <laughs> so the next hole, we're walking up the fairway and he's like, he like hustles up, you know, to John Elway. He's like, John Elway, the greatest quarterback of all time. It's the same spiel. You know, what, what, what was your secret? How'd you do it? And John's like, oh, I started playing when I was young and I really like football and that kind of stuff. And he would walk away and Elway come over here and he goes, I wish that guy would just shut the fuck up. We're trying to play golf. Those guys, you're talking about Jordan still into basketball saying he could take down so-and-so. These guys, even though they're not professional golfers, they are fucking want to play really good golf. So we get to this, we get to this par three and my son, Daniel, who caddies now had to be all of nine years old or 10 years old, right? We're posted up on this par three. There's like two groups. 
And Trump goes to his bodyguard. He goes, man, I could really use a Coke, a couple of Cokes. And the bodyguard's like, oh, I can't really leave you and that kind of stuff. And my son's standing on the tee behind us. And he's like, oh, Mr. Mr. Trump, I'll go get you a couple of Cokes. Did I tell Aww. you this? No, Aww. I'll go get you a couple of Cokes. And he's like, looks at me. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go get me a couple of Cokes, kid. So my kid runs over and gets a couple of Cokes for him, gives it back, you know, and my kid, there's probably six bucks or something like that. I probably gave my kid a $20 allowance for the day and said, don't get lost. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and he comes back into my son and he hands my son the Cokes. He doesn't say thank you, first of all. You know, and Sam's just like, he didn't say thank you, Bob. And I'm like, yeah, I noticed that. And um, uh, and my son's waiting for the money for it, right? My son's sitting there waiting for the money. Smart kid. Waiting for the money. Never and gonna Sam get just walks up to Trump and he goes, hey, Donald, are you going to stiff my caddy's kid on the Cokes? That's big money for him. And he looks right at my kid. He goes, I don't have any cash on me. I don't know why I told that story, but it was just like, it was just a funny story. It's just a well, funny story. And then funny he's story. out there at the live event, right? So yeah. he's, he's hitting his shots. He's he's throwing his right leg out in front. Yeah, <laughs> He's and, taking and, the and, step. And Norman, so, so let's go. Did you happen to listen to the Greg Norman and Tucker Carlson? Today? So I didn't listen to it. I obviously <laughs> saw all the headlines and everything yeah. to it. I yeah. just, I... Yeah. I there's something to be said that it's almost like a bashing party. And it I've never liked, I, I've never liked that. Uh, and I it's know. funny because we have an unfiltered golf podcast, but th that yeah. being said, I don't like the full on bashing of one side or another. I tend to try to find my middle ground within everything. And that's where I'm like, He's going on so that he can talk about the PGA Tour. And sure enough, who does yeah. he end up bringing up is Tiger Woods oh, and I, the seven know. to $800 uh, million dollar uh, deal. Tiger hears that shit. I, you know, you don't see a lot of Tiger Woods and that kind of stuff, but Tiger hears that shit all the time and he remembers that shit. You know what I mean? Yep. So if, if they ever cross paths again, I know Tiger well enough that they're going to have a few, a few words because that's kind of like private information, right? When you talk about Tiger Woods, you don't, you know, he's been through his shit and everything like that, but I don't. I think that was disrespectful of you him. You don't to bring up him. his name and bring up contract negotiations and all yeah. of that. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then you hear Tiger talk at the Open Championship, right? And mm -hmm. it hit me during the Open Championship. We actually didn't get to talk about this. I don't think I talked about this with you um, off air. Is that Tiger at first when he had that very strong rhetoric about mm -hmm. live golf and everything, and he hadn't said, it, said anything really prior. Like right. that was his first like strong sentiment against it. And it hit me. I'm like, because I, I really had to digest it. I had to understand it. And then it's like, whoa, the goat just said something that <laughs> we need to, we need to look into this. And it hit me that tiger's the one that built the damn PGA <coughs> that is today. You ain't kidding. There's guys. I, 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 it's I why guys that. are being paid. It's why that live golf exists yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's made, I mean, he's put, he's put, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a, a, able to pay more bills because of Tiger. That's why all these purses have gone up. And, you know, when I was, when I was playing junior golf and stuff in the late seventies and high school golf in the early eighties, I was a nerd, right? Golf wasn't cool. And then all of a sudden the big man comes on and every, and, and golf, and golf became super, super cool. Hey, did you hear what did you hear is what he told Tucker Carlson? So the LPGA is on this big mission to get a little respect and they yep. deserve it. Right. These are the best women in the 100%. world. 100 percent. And they're athletes. phenomenal golfers. They have been brushed under the rug too long and it's time for that to end. You know, give these yep. women their they are phenomenal. They are phenomenal. What did he athletes. say about the LPGA? He said that Aramco has been funding the, the LPGA forever, 100%. Aramco is the big, you know, the government of Saudis. It's yeah. one of their big petroleum companies. I Googled it up a little bit. That You know, they're worth make $109 billion a year or something like that. And, and I really respect, I've never met her before, but this young lady out there, Brittany Lincecum, you know that name. She's oh, yeah. a stud, play, stud player out there. And she just fired back. She's like, this guy's so full of... I mean, I'm putting in my own words, but she's sure. like, this kid is so, so full of shit. But I guess my point is, how dare he start? You know, there's a new commissioner. These girls are finally getting some respect. Their purses are going up. Their TV is going up. They're getting the respect they deserve. And he has to take up front. 
shot like that at the at the LPGA, which is probably just totally a political comment. You know, I mean, it's just like I just well, think with, that's well, with the, he's with naive. The, you know what the yeah, word is? I'm that, sorry, to remember that, that wasn't right. He's fucking naive yeah. is what the great Greg Norman is is naive to think these things. And you know, and I'm going to tell you one thing right now that I know for a fact. He's fucking out on January 1st. Mark King's coming in. It's official. It's a done deal. I've heard it from a million people, a million sources. I can't believe this hasn't leaked out. You know, it's it's probably not going to leak out. So talk about who Mike or Mark King. Mark King. Mark King is I the keep former, saying Mike. It, this is it, I said King, the same thing when he, we talked about this off air. He, he, he is when he is the former CEO of TaylorMade slash president of Taylor made golf. I met him a few times. He played with the pro-am when I was working for Dustin because Dustin was like one of their big guys, big businessman. I'm not sure what Norman's role is going to be, but I think, I think to the grapevine that Norman's getting a little bit over the top and he's got the players that he needed to get, but he is good night. Irene on January 1st. Now I don't know if he's going to go think to he's going to be the face still. Well, I'm, I, I've heard maybe not, but I know Mark King is coming in to run this show. He's a savvy, savvy, savvy businessman. He knows his numbers. He went to home of golf a little bit after yeah, that. He did Gosh, as a I consultant. Say when Taco Bell was tanking, Taco Bell might have hired him to to bring bring things up. So that is that is big news that Mark King that Mark King is going to start running this on January first. Done deal, folks. You heard it first on on pull hook up you know i meant i made a comment that i think norman is is naive is because i can tell you that i'm sitting in the airport on sunday nights i usually travel home on monday mornings because i'm getting a little bit older and i don't like getting on a plane especially connecting plane and fly all night but now that my boys you know my birthday was coming up my boys wanted to see me so i took a flight home and i ran into steve sands our broadcaster yeah. for the golf channel legend and and he told me that um I guess he had some words with the president of QBE. So the QBE shootout is a silly season event that happens, you know, in late November, early December, you know, it's that team team event. It used to be the shark shootout, right? So apparently, you know, there was like, oh, it's the QBE still going to be slash shark shootout still going to be part of the schedule and that kind of stuff. And I guess this guy told Greg that Greg called this like president or something. Sandy was telling me, and he's like, hey, we're, you know, we're still going to have the tournament and that kind of stuff. And the QBE guy's like, oh, yeah, we're still going to have the tournament. And he's like, yeah, it's my tournament and that kind of stuff. And, and the QBE guy's like, it's not your fucking tournament anymore, Greg. Don't be so naive. You know, this is and they released the schedule. I, I think they have, the schedule is officially released for us today. And there there it is, the QBA shoot, QBE shootout. But, you know, it's a it's not a sanctioned event, but it's on the PGA tour. But sure. I don't. You're not going to, there ain't no way Uncle Jay's going to let Norman's name, no. Norman's name be on that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that line was drawn in the sand. I'm just curious to see if Greg Norman is still going to be not only a part of it, but if he's going to be the face of it still. So you bring in somebody above him. I mean, yeah. he, he te- I, I believe his What's title that is CEO, to his ego? right? What's that do to his ego, though, too, you know? Well, an ego guy is not going to take that one lightly. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. So we will see. So I guess they're off this week and they got a tournament coming up and – Man, I don't even know. Mr. Golf, Bobby Brown doesn't even know. I know they got a tournament coming up in Boston. Is that the fall? Is that the next? It wouldn't be the same week as Memphis. Norman's not that stupid to schedule something that would slice a FedEx Cup event, would he? I actually he, don't know off the top of my head. Did you know? Did you know? So remember I was talking about Wyndham, like there's a tournament within the tournament. This is the last full season regular event, right? So top 125 guys keep their status, right? They got full status next year. Um 126 through 150 goes into a different category. They shuffle up and they get in anywhere from, you know, depending where you shuffle, 12 to 18 or 20 events. So it's always a very, it's always a very exciting week at Wyndham. And all of a sudden I've had a brain lapse where I was going with this. Oh, I was talking about where is this next, when is this next Boston tournament? Do you, can you look at it up? Do you have it on your phone on live or something yeah, like so, that? So let's take a look here. So the next Live event is Boston September 2nd to the 4th. See, he's, I'll give him credit. Yeah, I'll give him credit. That's, that's not, smart. we're not, dude, that's after our playoffs, yeah. right? He's not gonna, he's not gonna talk about, 
you know, how strong his field is compared to the John Deere field. Like, no shit, man. It's John Deere. Guys are tuckered out. The varsity doesn't play that. But he, <laughs> he was pretty smart on that scheduling. He knew exactly what he was doing on that. He knew exactly what he was doing on that. So I, I would, I'm just curious to see what's going to happen next. There's going to be, you know, you read about all these. It's going to be interesting. I mean, yeah. there, there's a lot that is still unknown, right? The one thing mm -hmm. I will tell you is that mm -hmm. no doubt, and I'm going to say it here first, is that this is a success. Live Golf mm -hmm. is a success. It's going to be around. It's going yeah. to be something to where probably a merger is going to need to take place at some point okay. and turn it into kind of this like lifestyle. Like I've said from the beginning, I, I've said a couple of things from the beginning. One was that it's a lifestyle tour, which has proven true. Like guys yep. that have gone over there are looking at yep. a freedom of schedule. I mean, they've got weeks off in between yeah. this last event to all yeah. of a sudden the final grouping of events. So like to them, like they get to go spend more time doing other things, but then it's the guaranteed contracts. And that's yeah. the one thing that quote me here that within the next five years, the PGA tour will have guaranteed contracts. I'm going to tell you what else is going to happen quicker than that. Just like you and James, you brought up weeks ago and James Hahn talked about it too. These guys are missing the cut. are going to finally start getting, making some money. You remember when James Hahn called me out? He's like, Bobby, what's so good about, why do you think missing the cut and not getting paid is, is a good thing? And I didn't say it was a good thing. I was saying that I'm a creature of habit. I'm used to it ever since yeah. I started caddying in 2004. It's always been like that. You know, it, it's just like you miss the cut, you go home you lose money. And now I, you guys are hundred percent, right? It's going to change. These guys are going to make eight or $10,000. And like James said, you know, nobody knows that they get paid in the majors. They get their 10 grand if they miss the cut. And, you know, but James hearts this month. You're a smart man, Matt. You picked off a lot of this shit, you know, before bitter. I, I just can't articulate bomb. it well yeah. enough to get people to buy into it. So yeah. it's like, I noticed these things and I'm like, Hang on a second. There was fault number one, which was Jay coming out and making a big deal about live golf. That okay. was mistake number one. Then you've got the fact that, yeah, golfers should be compensated because even if Tiger Woods goes out and misses a cut, how much money did the tour make because Tiger Woods was there? It's like uh -huh. when you look at it that way, it's like, yeah, everybody should technically be paid a some something. A fee for showing up to that event might not be a guaranteed contract per se that's going to take years, but in order to compete, it's going to be something that the PGA Tour is going to have to implement, I feel like, unless Liv just stays at 48 golfers, right? And mm -hmm. they have this relegation that's going to take place. And it's just you've got this select group of players, which actually I think is good for the fans because for yeah. years, the casual fan is like, who yeah. are these guys that are on this leaderboard. I have no idea. I don't see Phil Mickelson. I don't see Tiger Woods. I'm not interested. And now you get to see week in and week out when, granted, not week in and week out, but whenever there's a live golf event, you're seeing the same guys, uh -huh. right? You're seeing uh -huh. the same amount of coverage. You're not seeing a lot of the guys that are unknown that are on live. You're seeing a lot of the guys that are well-known players. But yeah. let me bring up one last thing that I know we haven't talked about. Turk Pettit. Yeah. This kid is real. Why do, why do you say that? This kid came out. So he ended up finishing. Gosh, what did he end up finishing? Like in the top 10 at so this live know, golf event. You know, I taught, you know, I touted you on him. He, he played he at did. Clemson. He had never won a golf tournament. And then he went, then he went Yahtzee and won nationals. Remember I told you a Greyhawk and I'm, I live here in Charleston I live here in Charleston, South Carolina, and and a gentleman here who was named Joe Rice, who's a big attorney, he was on the BP oil spill and the big tobacco, and he built a golf course out here called Bulls Bay. He's very connected to, uh, well, University of South Carolina, he's really connected to, but he started his own agency at Harold Varner. He's had some other players and that kind of stuff. So his... So his his son in law is one of his agents, one of his managers, and he recruited Turk Pettit. And they actually, you know, I actually initiated the conversation. I'm like, hey, what's the deal with this Turk Pettit? I just watched this super athlete 
look great and that kind of stuff, you know, summarize, I'm interested in the kid, this kid, where's he, where he's going, yeah. but he finally played good last week, but he did not play good, any good the other two weeks. He was the one that I, that remember I told you, and I'm like, so what is this fucking Turk Pettit going to do? Is he blowing his corn fairy tour status, you know, well, that, for this? This, this kid's legit. He, he made, yeah. He, I saw it this know, week. Yeah, I, I believe I, I I believe you. I mean, I saw him, I saw him when he played nationals on television, and I was glued to him. And he had that like I'm not scared. He's look. got he that moxie to him. Yeah, man, he looks like it. He's good old good old he's good old Southern boy too. Super hot girlfriend. Um, <laughs> you know what it is though, Bobby. It takes yeah. a little bit to get comfortable on whatever tour you're. I know playing. that is. I know I know that as well as anybody. That's their, you know, that's for sure. So hopefully. Hopefully things work out for him and, and good for good for his agent. You know, they're, they're the agents are making a bunch of money. <laughs> you brought That's that up sure. before. It, it is kind of a it's not something that gets talked about a lot, but for sure, you've brought it up the past couple of weeks and you're spot on. I mean, these agents are licking their chops. These oh. are the largest. Con- I mean, they're guaranteed contracts. These aren't golf like talent agency yeah. contracts. Yeah. And Matt, every hit the nail on the head. You know, they don't have to wear the scarlet letter. The agents, you know, they're sitting in the office. They're not out all. They're not out all the time. Of course, they're all. They're all out. They're probably all out now at live because they want to be seen because they've done a great job and they're, you know, they've done a great job for their clients. Well, Bobby, can I tell you one thing on yeah, social sure. media? Because I, I try to keep a close ear to social media because that can be sometimes that kind of crowd mentality that all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're heading in this direction, and early on. It was all pro PGA tour. Mm-hmm. Everything was live golf is horrible. You mm-hmm. know, it's Saudi, it's blood money. It's awful. Mm-hmm. Like that was the rhetoric that was just constantly coming into the Twitters of the world, Instagram on every type of post that was coming out. Now it's the exact opposite. It's yeah. actually a lot of hatred towards the PGA tour. They've yeah. kind of played themselves out in the media. And then a lot of people even turned on people like, I mean, my favorite golfer is Justin Thomas. Probably my second is Cam Smith. And then okay. you got a plethora of other guys that I really, really like, like Max Homa, Tony Finau, and so forth. But when you look at all of a sudden this crowd mentality starting to shift towards live golf, and it's like, Oh, these are the cool kids in town. This is the fun place to go. And you don't have the golf purists that are in control of that rhetoric. All of a sudden, it's like I've seen a huge shift, a huge shift when it comes to all of the comments coming into all of the different posts, whether it's from Liv or whether it's from the PGA Tour. Like even when the PGA Tour has posted some stuff or Golf Digest or Golf.com, pro pga tour that's a little bit too far on the one side people absolutely are criticizing and taking that out on the tour that they're doing something wrong they're the bad guys in this and that's where the shift has gone so i'm i'm very curious to see how obviously this all unfolds moving forward um but i still stick to my original standpoint that the pga tour isn't going anywhere no, and live gonna golf be, is going to be a compliment. They're going to have a different. Years, right? It's at some point. It's probably not happening in the next couple of years, but at no, some point. But I also see it as this, Bobby, that if they don't do a merger, that they're going to coexist like the UFC and Bellator. Uh-huh. If you're if you're if you're an MMA fan, like you'll understand what that dynamic is because the UFC is the big guy. It, it like out of all the organizations. Bellator loves to say that they're like right there with them and like in a lot of ways, sure, but they've taken a lot of guys that have been either cut or they've signed them once they're out of their contract deals with the UFC and brought them over there. And I can see this working in that fashion, too, to where the organizations don't work together, but it's kind of like, you know, the big names that are towards their kind of end of their career and so forth. And they might grab a young guy here and there that's going to become a big star on Live Golf that you learn about through that. But I don't ever see the day to where there's not a big enough audience for both of them. Also, I'm going to say that, well, let's get close to to ending this. It's late over here, but I'm going to say I'm going to say this. From, from a guy who stands on the driving range and is with these guys all the day. It's quite any dead down out there. Guys are tired of listening to it. You know, oh, players, the players, players, are, players are tired. Of, you know, players, 
there, it was very, it was very, nobody was really talking about it. Oh, who's going now? Because not just because of the spots are filled, but I've heard walk by numerous players. They're like, I don't, I don't really give a shit anymore. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, is what it is, right? It is what it is. Yeah. They're, they're all tired of hearing it. So here's what I got. Let's end it with this. Here's what I got planned for us. You ready? I'm bringing on a live golf caddy is what I'm bringing on. And so we're going to get to hear, I'm not sure when it's going to happen. It could happen next week. It could happen the week after that. Um, We could plan it. So when it happens the week of Boston and that kind of stuff, but we're going to, I'm careful who I'm bringing on right now because a couple of those guys are jaded. That's for sure. You know, and they're really good caddies, the jaded ones that I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention any names, Kenny Harms, Kevin Nas guy, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but I'm bringing on a guy that is a super successful caddy and he's going to tell us because this is kind of the caddy season. He's going to probably tell us a lot of stuff that we don't know how great it is. And that kind of stuff. You know, what puts me in a bad mood though about it. Here's what puts me in a bad mood. It's like when you see fucking Austin Johnson out there with his wife and they're snapping pictures, like look at me. And you know, we won the team of it. And you know, I'm Dustin Johnson's brother and this is my, wife and look at us hold the oh there's some bitterness there bobby i'm fucking so bitter over shit i'm bitter over stuff like that and it's like it's my blood pressure going out of jealousy just because of the money or but it's also the way that it ended not not one of those guys has won one yet i know we're only three deep into this thing but super team hey fucking a 4.3 million dollars or your 750 for the team get up in the podium like your max verstappen you know, or Lewis Hamilton or something like that. I see that the caddies are spraying everything. And then there's, and then there's H Perez's guy, you know, who's never spent a dollar on anybody in his life. And he's <laughs> shaking the fucking champagne and Pat, way to shoot 80. Is this the hit and run you know? by the way? What? Cause you haven't hit us with a hit and run yet. Our, our segment. I guess, guy, I guess I just did. Yeah, I'm that's our hit and run with. segment. So right my there. wife, so Lori, so Lori's heard these podcasts and she's like, okay, can I give you a couple tips? And I'm like, well, you're a school teacher. <laughs> yeah, you can give me some tips. But she's like, you talk too fast. The audio sucks. Um, well, you always look down. Um, so I'm trying to. Is and, this the hit and like, run on and yourself? She's like, what's with the hit and run? She goes, you know, if you keep firing off these hit and runs and you turn the corner and you run into one of these guys, that's going to be the real hit and run. <laughs> <laughs> because you're 58. Happy birthday. <laughs> so we got to get, we're going to have a guest. I'm not revealing his name. I'm still tying up the details and that kind of stuff. He might be in Monaco right now, a caddy Ooh. that lives in Monaco. It's and, one of the spots uh, that I want to go. might have got a W. He might have got a W there on that live tour. And, and uh, we're going to get his side about how how cool the backpacks are they get and the free tumbler glasses and and the free shirts and the free oh hats. God, I, I can't wait for this. Time. One more thing too. I heard somebody was telling me last week that played, I think it was Chad Reynolds, Cameron Young's like, yeah, man, dude. Dustin was out at the British Open passing out Acer's team hats and everything like that. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, nobody fucking wanted one. <laughs> I was like, bro, you want a hat? And they're like, no, man. I mean, I'm <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want to be overweight baggage. <laughs> well, nobody wears them. It's like, if you're going to sell merch, you got to wear yeah. them. Like you're wearing our hat right now. Yes. Like they well, got to wear the this hat because I want people who watch this to see the sick ass lid. Can I tell you, not only am I a, a golf connoisseur and a shoe connoisseur, I got a hat problem and caddies love hats and you looking for the right fit. And I'll tell you what's good about this hat is because I usually wear sun, a lot of the time I wear sunglasses, you know, and I don't have, I'm like a seventh, it's seven and an eighth in, in new era land. Right. But the one thing for caddies is, is the way it fits down on your ear and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. You have sunglasses. Have you ever experienced that with a bad hat where it just yep. starts? And it hurts. hurting your ears oh my gosh this and these hats I, be, I rock them all during the practice rounds and that kind of stuff only because i don't want my you know i have I, i'm you know i have to do the titleist thing that's for sure because he's a titleist guy but i just don't you know it's just a great fitting hat and i never have got that problem with my sunglasses and the practice rounds and i've had some guys come up to me i've been rocking the white ones and they're like where'd you get that hat and everything? And I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm a big podcast host, man. Didn't you know? And they're like, what's a podcast again? <laughs> we went to the Padres, we went to the Padres game last week. Troy, um, myself, Troy, Mike, Scott Pierce, he's caddy and Troy's best friend, Robert Streb, one of the good guys on the PGA tour. And I had to leave in the fourth inning. He's like, Bobby B, where are you going? And I'm like, Oh, I have to do this. I have to do this podcast. Right. And he goes, Oh, and he 
had a couple whiskeys in or whatever. He's like, what do you got? Like 12, 12 people to listen or something like that. I fucking put my phone and I go, man, every got 1600 motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, so there's, <laughs> there's my little hit and run. But for any of you guys that are watching this, um, you have a merchandise store with these hats. We where do. You these hats so up, right. Pullhookgolf.com. Right. You can go there. And then one of the options on there is our shop. Okay. Or we set it up on Shopify. The hats are on there. We've got shirts. Good. We've Good. got crop tops for the ladies right. who want to look sexy in them. Um, right. I'm, I just ordered a bunch of stuff. So you're going to be seeing oh, some oh, live stuff yeah. here coming up shortly on Instagram. But pullhookgolf.shopify.com is where you can go to purchase all your pull hook golf merchandise. Each month, we're going to have new stuff that gets launched onto the shop. So make sure to take a look shop have some fun on there because there's some great stuff already i've got a mug coming so i can't wait i mean i know i normally drink out of my whiskey glass but right. um sure enough that coffee mug is yeah. going to hold whiskey and more of it plus Good. an ice cube in there so yeah. i think we're going to be Perfect. just fine moving forward Perfect. maybe even have some looser commentary from me Perfect. i don't know we'll find out but the other thing is too that you can go on to instagram and our handle is at Pull Hook Golf. So P U L L H O O K G O L F. And on there, if you go to our profile page, you're going to notice there's a section for our shop. You can shop direct, directly from Instagram as well. But before we take off, everybody, we just have to give a little birthday song to mr bobby oh, brown no song. you're not happy birthday to you at least i'm not doing it like mr president you know what i mean so yeah. happy birthday <laughs> to you <laughs> happy birthday mr bobby brown that's a beautiful hat that i own as well but happy birthday buddy <laughs> I appreciate that. And remember, folks, if you're if you're a golfer and you're looking for the hats that don't kill your ears, he nailed it. You ordered the right ones. Matt, Dude, thanks. They're that sick. Was, I love them. Yeah, that was cool, man. Appreciate hey, it. Great time, Bobby. Thank you okay, so buddy. much. All right, my man. See you. All right. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to Season 2 of the Pull Hook Golf Podcast. Make sure to hit subscribe and go to www.pullhookgolf.com for more information.